Well, hello, Internet. If you want to work with digital and analog signals, work with displays, ultrasonic sensors, motors, servos, you want to make a remote-controlled car, infrared, temperatures, accelerometers, sound, and a whole lot more, CircuitPython can do it for you. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to do it all. All right, so to get started, of course, you're going to have to install the CircuitPython system onto your board. So you're just going to go to circuitpython.org. And you're going to come up here where it says downloads and click on downloads. Now in this tutorial, I am going to actually use multiple different boards. I am going to use the Circuit Playground Express, the Circuit Playground Blue Fruits, and you don't need all of these. I just want to cover everything and it takes a lot to cover everything. And then finally, if you scroll down here somewhere, you'll see the Cricut Playground Express. Okay, so I'm going to use every one of these different devices and a whole lot more. And if you want to download them, you just click on this. And everything's exactly the same on Windows as well as on, on Macintosh. And you're just going to click Download UF2. All right. Then after you do that, you could see what they all look like right here. This is the standard Circuit Playground Express. This is the blue fruit right here and then somewhere else I have the cricket okay so you're gonna go and you're gonna get this it has a UF2 extension at the end of it and then you're just gonna drag it over to your board which needs to be plugged into your computer of course you're gonna drag it over there and drop it inside after you do that then your board is going to be called circuit PY all right, so then you know it's working correctly. And whenever you open it up, you're going to see something along these lines. And this is the library folder where we will be putting all sorts of different libraries and modules. Now what you're gonna do is get Moo. So go to code with dot Moo right here. And people have a love and hate relationship with it. It is ridiculously great at connecting to boards, automatically uploading to boards, getting input and output from boards. It's a great little IDE. Negative is sometimes it gets glitchy and you need to restart it. Another thing you do is hit control C, control D, and then it should fix it, all right? You can either use it or don't use it. It's, you can actually go and open up your little board right here and edit this file right here directly, code.py in a text editor and everything will work, but you won't be able to have access to all the input and output from your board in that way. But in this tutorial, I choose to use it, so I'm gonna go and click on download. And then you're gonna pick whether you want Windows or Mac or whatever you want, and just click on download and install that. Then whenever you open up Moo the very first time, what it's, it's gonna say select mode right here. I mean, if it doesn't show up, it's gonna show up. But if it doesn't, just click on mode, and you're gonna click on Circuit Python and click on OK. And this is what you get. Now remember I said a lot of times we're going to be using different libraries to make all of these components work. This is your library folder right here. Now to get every single library you're ever gonna need, you're gonna go to Adafruit Circuit Python Bundle Releases and just make sure that you are going to be using version six if you are using the version six of that UF2 file that I showed you before. Either way, if you go on here, you'll get the updated versions and you're going to want to click right here on Adafruit Circuit Python Bundle, right here, this zip file, and download it. And whenever you download that, this is what your library is going to look like if you open it up, all right? So there's all these different modules and we will be using a whole bunch of them in this tutorial series. Okay, so if ever your device doesn't mount, just make sure that you're using a USB cable that can transfer data as well as power because there's a lot of cables out there that only transfer power, those will not work. All right, and another thing is if you ever have any trouble with your board, just try single clicking or double clicking the reset button on your board and that often fixes it. All right, so here is Moo and this is where we're going to be writing all of our code. And the great thing is whenever you save a file by clicking save or just by hitting a shortcut key, it's automatically going to save to your board and automatically start running it. So let's do something here kind of simple. I am going to start simple and get much more complex as we continue. So I'm gonna say import, and let's zoom in a little bit here so you can see a little bit better, and board. This is going to provide access to all of the components on your board. This is going to allow you to interact with uh, input and output, digital input and output with your board. Import time is going to allow you to do things like cause your code to temporarily sleep or stop execution. And now what we want to do is we want to get access to our LED. So to do that, we're going to say digital 
io dot and digital in and out and we are specifically going to be targeting the d13 and i'm using the circuit playground express in this specific situation so pin 13 which is your led and i'm going to set the direction that it's the led is going to output which means it's going to blink so just go like this and direction output and then i'm going to create an indefinite loop it's going to basically run forever and what it's going to do of course is blink your ied so just set this to true that is going to turn it on we're going to keep it on for a fraction of a second let's say a half a second to do that you just put sleep inside of here and 0.5 and then we're going to turn the led off for a half a second and we're going to continue this forever or until you unplug it so set this to false to turn the led off and then go and have it sleep some more all right and then you're just going to click save on this and here is the little window that is going to show up you can just click on save and whenever we do other different more complicated programs output from your board is going to show up down here and now i'll show you the blinking led and here it is on the board blinking away all right so you saw the blinking led let's get into more complicated things now the your circuit python board is also going to be able to display information on your computer using the serial console which is down here and you just click on the serial button up here to get this to show up and any output from your code is long as well as error messages are also going to be displayed down here and if you ever want to cancel execution just click down here and go control c and that is going to shut it off and control d well right now we are in the repl which is going to allow you to automatically go and execute code inside of here so i'm going to show you how to do that so you can actually go in and go import board like that and then go dir board like this and it's going to show you all of the different parts of your board that you the, the specific board you have plugged in right now that you have access to so you have all of your different pins and buttons and accelerometers and microphones and all of this stuff this is all the things you can interact with you can also see all of the modules that you have the ability to work with by just saying help modules and you can see there's a whole ton of different things that are built inside of here so all kinds of awesome stuff if you want to leave this and get back into your coding window you just go control d and you can see right here it's saying that whenever you save your code up here it's going to automatically load it up and run it okay and to get access to all of those libraries you can just go to circuitpython.org forward slash libraries here are all of those libraries you can see this is version 6 the which is compatible with the other version that i automatically or i showed you before that i uploaded my board and if you just click on this it's going to download every single library you're going to need so now I'm going to show you how to work with NeoPixels as well as buttons and, and capacitive touch and a whole bunch of other different things. Now, like I said before, the import board is just going to provide access to all that hardware that I just showed you, all of these different things here. Okay, so that's what that gives us. Digital I.O. is a module that provides classes that allow you to interact with the digital components on your board. I'm also going to come in here and say from digital I.O import digital in out direction and pull now the digital in and out provides a digital pin object that provides a whole bunch of functions and per different parameters that you can use to set for all of your digital pins direction is going to define if the digital pin is going to accept input or provide output like we saw previously and pull is going to define the default for input meaning that it is either high or low meaning uh, there is a flow of current or there is not a flow of current i'm also going to go and work with neopixels so i'm going to say import neopixel and then like i said before input time is going to allow us to come in and pause code execution now if you want to be able to use neopixels go and get your little library you have here a whole bunch of different files and scroll way down to the bottom here where it says neopixel.mpy and then just open the board up and make sure that you have neopixel inside of here right now i have an ir remote library as well as another one for working with servo motors 
So I want the NeoPixel one, so I just select it, and then I just go and drop it into this library folder, right like that, and now we have all kinds of additional capabilities. So what do I want to do here? Well, I want to go and get my LED, and again, I'm gonna say digital in and out, board dot D13, and this just assigns the LED on our board to this variable named LED. I'm going to set the direction for my LED now. So direction and direction, it is going to provide output. I'm going to want to work with NeoPixels. So to do so, you go NeoPixel dot NeoPixel board NeoPixel. And I'm gonna say that I want to manipulate up to two of them, and I want the brightness default to be set to 0.1. Now I'm gonna go and uh, get us, or basically assign to this variable the A button. So again, digital in and out, and my A button ha is at D4. Don't forget to put an equal sign inside of here. All right, now this button is going to be accepting input, so I have to say, tell it that it's going to be accepting input. So direction dot input. And if I want to set the default for my button, I just say pull is equal to pull down. So there we go. That is our A button and it's all set up. I'm going to do exactly the same things for my B button. So I'm just going to copy this, paste that in there and let's put a space and let's just change this to B. Of course, I'm gonna to have to use a different pin, so this is going to be D5, and input and pull are going to be exactly the same. I'm going to do something similar for my switch, and to get access to the switch, you go digital in and out, and board dot D7. I am going to set the direction for my switch, so the switch is going to be providing input as well. It's either going to be turned on or off. And again, I'm going to say that I want its pull direction to be set to pull up. Now it gets to our loop. So I'm gonna say, wow, true, which means it's gonna basically execute forever. And here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, if the A button is pressed, and we just type in value here. Well, in that situation, I wanna turn on my LED. So I'm gonna say LED value is equal to true. That's like saying, yes, I want it turned on. And you can come in and say something like A pressed, something along those lines. And I can say, otherwise, if the A button is not pressed, I can say that I want my LED value to be set to false. And then we could say something like not pressed. All right, so drop that there, A not pressed. Now we're going to do pretty much exactly the same thing for our B button. So let's just come in here, paste that inside of there. And for this, what I do want to do with my A or the B button, anyway, first I got to change that to B button. This time I want to light up a NeoPixel. Now the NeoPixels are in a list. There are 10 of them. And if I want to light up the very first one, I just put a zero in there and the very first one has an index of zero. The next one has an index of one, two, three, four, and it keeps on going on and on. And I wanna set this to red. So I'm gonna say 255, zero, and zero. This one, if it's 100%, that's red, green, blue, okay? So no green, no blue, 100% red. And it's saying set the first pixel to light up, red. And I can change this to be pressed. All the print stuff's gonna show up down here, by the way. And otherwise, I want to turn off that LED. So to do that, I just come up here, let's get rid of this, throw that there, and then change this to zero. So when the B button is not being pressed, it's going to turn all the lights off. That's what happens when everything is zero. All right, so now let's make the switch work. So for the switch, I'm gonna say, if switch value, that means it's on. In that situation, I am going to turn on another NeoPixel. Now remember, up here, I said I wanna work with up to two NeoPixels. So that has to be two if you're gonna work with multiple NeoPixels. And if I want the next NeoPixel in the list, well, I'm gonna to have to say that I want one. So that's the NeoPixel I want to work with in this situation. You can change it to a different color, do whatever you want. Why don't we do that? Why don't we change this to zero and change this to 255? Otherwise, we're going to say 
uh, else, paste that in there, and pixels one, and everything's off, and I'm just gonna get rid of this print statement because we don't need it. Then after that, it's always good to put a fraction of a sleep cycle in here to pause for execution. And you can see right here, everything is working, and what I'm gonna do is actually go over and show you the code executing. And you can see here, I turned on the switch, and then I'm going to press on, well, I turned the switch off, and then I'm gonna press the A button, and now I am going to press the B button, and there you go. And I decided to change my theme here. You just click on this to change your theme into whatever you want it to be. And I just wanna demonstrate here that basically, your board has like Python built into it. It can do almost anything that you wanna do with regular Python code. So of course we can say that we want to say hello. You can see everything executed down here. So if I drag this up and I roll up here, you can see it printed hello. You're going to get five uh, decimal digits of accuracy with your floating point values. Here is how we can add floats. You're going to be able to cast between integers, floats, and strings. Here what I did was I went and turned F1, which is a floating point value, this right here, into an integer, just put int with parentheses. You can see the math operators and how we print using all that. You can see here I formatted to two decimal places. Whenever I subtracted two from five, you can see all the different mathematical operators. This is modulus, which gets you the remainder of a division. This is the power function and such. And this is going to be integer division. We have tons of math functions built inside of here. And I'm gonna put a link to all of the code in this entire tutorial so you'll be able to get it. But just wanted to show you that you can basically use Python with your board, almost 100% Python. And this is how we can go and get random integers between one and 100. All right, so just wanted to give you a brief little shot there of all the code you can actually run on this board, which is extremely impressive. And if you want more, like I said, look in the description and you can have more. All right, so we got the same type of libraries here, Time Board NeoPixel, which you've already seen. I'm going to show you now how to work with analog data. So I'm gonna go analog IO import analog, and I'm gonna use a variable resistor, and as it changes, you're going to see that. And we're just going to connect this to the A3 port. I'm gonna show you here in a second exactly how to set up all the hardware. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect analog in is going to be assigned to analog in and it's going to be the a3 pin on your board you can have it be any pin it doesn't matter and what i want to do here is i want to hold the pixel count before any changes are made to my variable resistor so i'm going to say px previous and i'm going to light up the neo pixels depending upon the changing amount of current i'm also going to get the current value and we're going to be switching back and forth and i'm doing all this just so that i can have the neopixels light up and then turn off as the resistance changes and going to say pixels is equal to neopixel dot neopixel board neopixel and this is going to create a pixel list and this time i want to use every one of the available pixels so i'm going to say 10 and then I'm gonna set my default brightness to be equal to one again, because they're so bright. Now I'm gonna create a function. Yes, you can create functions as well. This function is going to be called update pixels. And this is how we define functions. Just type in DEF, name of your function, parentheses, if you wanna pass something in, I'm not passing anything in in this situation. And I'm gonna say if pix previous number is not meaning is not equal to the current number, then I want to turn all of the pixels off, and then I will recolor them afterwards. And this is basically going to handle whenever I want less pixels to be lit versus, you know, more. Now what I want to do is cycle through the number of pixels that I want to light, and for each one of those, I'm going to get their index, Let's put I inside of there for that, and then turn on, and I'm just gonna have them be red, like this. Now I create my infinite loop. So again, while true, 
and these are going to have a range between 0 and 65,535. So a value is going to be assigned analog in dot value because I only have 10 lights to light up. So, you know, that's what I want to work with here. And I also, basically it's a generic value between zero and 65,535. And if I want to actually display in voltage, which is 3.3 in our specific situation, well then I have to say print a value times 3.3 and then divide by 65, 5, 36 and then if I want to go and convert them to values between 0 and 10 I go and get my current number which is the number of pixels I want lit and I'm going to cast this floating point value into an integer a whole number and to do that I divide by 65 5 3 right like that now after I have that all set I can call my update pixels function and then after this, do a little sleep and point two. And I made a little error here. I put an extra parentheses there, so only make sure you have one. And up here for fill, I forgot to put zero in, so I'll put that in there. And I also want this right here to be the number of pixels lit up. All right, so paste that in there and run it. And you can see that yes, indeed, it is working and I will show you exactly what's going on over on the board. All right, and you can see here, I have a potentiometer connected. I am connected to the 3.3. I'm connected to the A3 pin as well as ground. And as I, it's decreasing the resistance here, I am going to see all the NeoPixels light up and then it goes back down again. Now I'm gonna show you something ridiculously cool. I'm gonna show you how to use a thing called a gizmo, which is a little display you can connect to your CPX or CPB or whatever, but we're gonna need a couple different libraries. We are going to need Adafruit ST7789, this guy right here. So just copy that and go over into your library folder and paste that inside of there. I'm also, I'm gonna be showing weather inform, or temperature information, light information, as well as using the accelerometer. I'm also going to need Adafruit Gizmo, which is right here. Just go and get the whole folder right there. Copy that, paste it in, and Adafruit Display Text. So this guy, again, the whole entire folder, copy it, paste it inside of there. There we go. And anytime something's executing, just hit Control C. There you go. Control D. And that starts it running again. So let's just do Control C. All right. So we're going to need a whole bunch more modules. So I'm going to go and get uh, a module that has a whole bunch of display functions. So it is display IO. I'm going to need a font. And I'm going to use this terminal font. And that's what's going to be displayed. I'm going to also need to be able to print a label on here. So we go add a fruit, display, text, and specifically import label. You'll see that in a minute. I'm gonna need a bunch of functions for my gizmo, which is the little display screen. So that's gizmo, and I'll call import TFT and gizmo. I'm also going to be using the temperature sensor, so I need another module. That is add a fruit thermistor. And then I'm also going to use my sound sensor because I'm going to sense how much sound or how loud the surroundings are. So circuit, playground, import, CP. And you can see all these different libraries that I put inside of here. So there's all of the different libraries, okay? There's NeoPixels, you don't need those, but whatever. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna create my little gizmo, which is going to be my display. So I'm gonna say display is equal to TFT gizmo dot TFT underscore gizmo. And now I'm gonna define how many elements I want to be able to display. I'm gonna have it be 30. 
So you say display IO dot group and max size is equal to 30. I'm gonna say that I want to show these elements. So we'll say splash. Now if I wanna get temperature data, I can say temp and I'm gonna get it in Fahrenheit. So I say CP temperature and to get it into Fahrenheit, multiply times nine, divide by five and add 32. Then temperature string, what I wanna display on my display, I'm gonna have temp like this. And then if I want to put the temperature information, I have to convert it into a string and temp Fahrenheit like this. And then I wanna put a new line afterwards. So a new line like that. And that's gonna both get my temperature data as well as display it. Now, if I wanna go and get my sound, I'm gonna go sound string is equal to sound. And then to get the sound data, I go string CP dot sound level. And then I'm gonna throw another new line on here. I also wanna get the amount of light that is shining on the sensor. So to do that, I say light. And then again, I need to convert this into a string and call CP and light like that with a new line. Okay, now what I'd like to do is go and get tilt information so I can get X, Y, and Z for the tilt. To do that, you call CP and this is acceleration. And the way this is going to work, there's actually a little spring in, be in between different plates in the accelerometer and that is going to provide you all your X, Y, and Z data. It's really cool. So um, I'm gonna call this tilt string and I will just have it output X. And if I wanna get string value for X and then I'm going to say that I wanna put a new line and then I'm gonna have the value for Y and there's Y. And then I'm going to finally have Z Again, another new line, Z, and then the new line, or the Z data. All right, so there we go, got all our information from our sensors. Now what I wanna do is draw the label. So I'm gonna say text group is equal to display IO group, and I'm gonna say max size is equal to 10. I wanna scale this to double its normal size. And I'm gonna say that I want to start placing this text in 10 pixels from the top and 10 pixels from the left. Well, the upper left-hand corner of your display is zero, zero. So I'm gonna have this be X is equal to 10 and Y is equal to 10. This is then going to be the text that I want to display. So it's going to be my temperature data plus my sound data write that, plus the light data, plus the tilt data. Now I'm gonna use my terminal font. So text area is equal to, and also my label. So there is my font, and there that is. Text is going to be the text string that I just created. And color, let's have this be zero X, F, 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 O, O. Then I need to append to the subgroup. So I'm gonna say text group append the new text area. If I want to add the text to the screen, I say splash append text group. And now I'm gonna create my infinite loop. So I'll say while true. And I'm gonna sleep for one second before I update the screen. Then I'll say temperature equal to CP temperature times nine divided by five plus 32. Temperature string is gonna be the same. So let's just copy this just to save time. Paste that in there. Let's just copy all of this stuff. Paste it all inside of there. And then after we do this, we can go 
text, area, text, and it's gonna be exactly the same as before. So text and area dot text is equal to this guy right here. Just copy it all, paste it inside of there. I'm gonna go display show splash, paste that there, and then display refresh. And we went and loaded it, and I went and threw it in comments inside here just to show you what all of these different modules do. Like I said, the code's in the description. And now let's jump over and I'll show you the output. And here you can see we were able to measure temperature, sound, as well as light, and the accelerometer is working to give us our tilt information and pretty cool stuff. And I just wanted to show you this briefly. We've been using if and else a lot. You can also use else if, which is abbreviated E-L-I-F. And yes, indeed, the ternary operator also works inside of CircuitPython. So our example here, I have age is equal to six, and then I determine what school they should go to. You can see this is the way we can use formatting to put the decimal result of this subtraction directly inside of here just between curly braces, a colon, and a D for the decimal, the number. And you can also see down here what it says is if this condition is true, the age is over 18, so true, well, then I'm going to make this as true is going to be put right here. And if the age is less than 18, then false is going to go right here. And you can see this sample output if indeed the person is age 6. All right? So another thing, and now let's get back into another electronics project. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is show you how to detect taps as well as turn your little board into a little keyboard and also how capacitive touch works. So again, we're gonna use, we're gonna do this import right here, it just provides access to a ton of different hardware functions, time for sleep. Okay, so let's come in and write the code. So the very first thing I want to do here is I want to define that we want to react to one tap. You could put two inside of here, and then it will only do things if the board is tapped twice. But I want it to be tapped one time to do something. All right. So that's how we do this. Then I'm going to define some notes so, so that we can play Mary Had a Little Lamb. So the frequency for C4 is 261.63 and I'm going to do this also let's paste this in here paste this in here and this is 293.66 and this is 329.63 change this to D change that to E I can also create lists inside of here so let's say I say list one is equal to, and then inside of here, I can throw all my different notes. So I can go note E4, and let's just copy this to save some time. And this is a list that I'm gonna be able to use to play multiple notes. And I'll show you how to do that as well. So little melodies. So we can go C4, and this is gonna be D4, and E4, and E4, and E4. All right, so there you go, I created a list. Now I'll create my infinite loop. So I'll say while true, if the board is tapped, well, I can print out that it was tapped, if I would like, and I could also play a tone. This is how you play tones. So play tone. And I'm going to have my tone, I can just go and put in 26163, or I can put in this value right here, whatever you'd like to do. Have it play for half a second. And then I can react to different button presses as well. So let's say that I want this to be the A button. Well, this is just button A like that. So providing multiple different ways to access the A button information. Let's change this to D4. Well, I don't need this. Let's just get rid of that all together. Change this to D4. And then this is going to be button B. Button B. Get rid of the tap part again. And let's just change button B to E4. We can also have capacitive touch work. To do that, you say CP touch and then the specific 
capacitive touch pin, which is a one in this situation. I can go and play tone. And let's say I want this to be three, nine, two, zero, zero, half a second. And then finally, another capacitive touch. This is A2. And in this situation, I want to cycle through this list of notes and play all of them. So I'm going to say four, I, in, range, length, and the list, L1, and then cycle through and play all of those tones. And I'm just going to change this to L1 and throw an I inside of there. And it'll cycle through the entire list and play all those notes. All right, so there it is. And now I'll show you how it works. And here you can see the tap is going to work. And then, of course, all of the buttons are going to work as well as the capacitive touch. So pretty cool stuff. Now I'm going to show you how to be able to interact with infrared devices. This specifically, we're going to use a remote control. And later on, we're going to use this remote control to remake a remote controlled car. So again, we need to import board. We're also going to import pulse. IO, which is going to provide functions for reading IR input. I'm also going to be need to be able to read from infrared devices of such as a remote control. And in the description, I'll put a link to the remote control I'm using, but you can use any remote control. Now, of course, you're going to want to go and get these devices. So put that remote inside of there. If you have things inside of your library folder, you don't need, don't worry. It's not going to cause an error. So you can just, as you're adding libraries, just leave them in there. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to read IR input using my, R, my IR receiver. So to do that, you say pulse in is equal to pulse IO dot pulse in and board dot IR RX. And I'm going to say that I want my max length to be 120 pulses. And my idle state is going to be true. Then I need a decoder. This is going to decode infrared signals. And it is at IRR mote dot generic decode then infinite loop. So I'll say while true, I need to read pulses until they stop pulsing up to 120. So decoder dot read pulses, pulse in. Then here's exception handling. There's a chance that something could go wrong. And in that situation, I want to be able to handle those exceptions. First, I want to try to decode the pulses into bits so that I can use them basically turning pulses into numbers. So I'm going to say received code is equal to decoder dot decode bits and pass it pulses. And it does it for us. I can then print out this information decoded. And then we're going to output the received code like that. Now I handle the exceptions that I could expect. One of them is an NEC repeat exception. And that just means that it received a strange code it doesn't understand. And there is the full exception. And if that happens, I'm just gonna say received strange code. Most situations you won't do anything about it. Just some outside interference. Oh, we're going to do continue to continue the loop from the beginning. That's what that does. And then I will also do add a fruit remote IR decode exception. And in that situation, you can also come in here and say as E and then output information about the specific exception if you'd like. But in this situation, I'm just going to say failed to decode the message or whatever. And then continue. And there you go. And now what I can do is jump over and show you it interacting with the input from my remote control. 
Okay, so I, as you can see, I hit Control C, Control D, saved it. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to receive different inputs here. So that was the power button. This is one, this is two, this is three. Oops, didn't get three. There's three and there is five. And whenever we create our remote controlled robot later on, that is going to be very valuable. All right, so now what I wanna do is show you how to work with servos using a Cricut with a CPX, Circuit Player Ground Express. Remember, you're gonna to have to go get the Cricut specific UF2 file, drag that over to your board for this to work. All right, and we're gonna import time again, and we're gonna import the Cricut specific module. Add a fruit and Cricut and import Cricut. And I can go and print some message about the testing the servo or doing something, but I'm just gonna type in Cricut and servo. After this, I'll show you how to work with servos with just a CPX board. Now, if I want the angle of this to be 15, I just say 15 like that. And I'm gonna do a little sleep here. Make, give everything time to get into position. Let's say one second and I can go Copy this and do it for other angles. So let's say I want it to go 90. I can do that. Let's say I want it to 165. Now we're using a 180 servo, but I'm using a cheap one that really only goes to 165. If I go over that, it could potentially burn out, destroy my board and do all kinds of things. Definitely if you're using servos and they start whining, you know, making a noise like that, that means you're trying to go too far. And if you let them just sit there going zzz like that, they will burn up or burn up your board. So don't do that. All right, so wow, true. And this time I'm going to have them go in a loop. So let's go, I think I actually have this saved. Yes, I do. So let's just paste that inside of there. So this way I want it to go 15, wait a second. And then I want it to go 90. So let's go like this and do a 90 and it'll repeat indefinitely until the program shut down. So I'll do this, throw that there. Let's go 165 and then let's go and do one more. Let's have it be 90 or something or 15. That's fine. And just do it like that and it will repetitively keep moving in these different angles. Okay, well actually let's do it 90 and then whenever it goes back up to the loop, it'll go 15. Okay, so cool stuff. And now I'm gonna show you it working. All right, so you can see here is a CPX board on top of a Cricut. I have it plugged in so that the yellow wire is pointing out towards the edge and you can see the servo working. All right, this time we're gonna need another library. Actually, if you don't include this library in the serial uh, window down here, it'll say, hey, I don't know where this library is and it'll actually give you the name. So Adafruit Motor is what we need this time. So put that in your lib folder. And what's specific? Well, what I'm gonna do here is work, make servo mo motors work with the CPX board. So I'm gonna say import PWMIO from Adafruit motor import servo. All right. So the very first thing I wanna do is create a pulse width modulation out object. So I'm gonna say, Pulse width modulation is equal to pulse width modulation IO dot PWM out and board. This is going to be A3, which is where the pin we're going to assign it to. And what you need to also pass inside here, it says right there. So we have to do duty cycle and duty cycle is the percent in which the pulse is high. And that's basically it. So duty cycle. And we're gonna set this to two and 15. And the frequency, which is gonna be in Hertz, is gonna be set to 50. Now I'm going to create a servo object that's gonna be past all that data. So servo dot servo PWM. And there is our infinite loop and it's gonna do all that stuff. And you're also going to be able to set individual angles and such if you'd like, but I'm just gonna keep this nice and simple. So I'm gonna say four angle in range 
and I want to go 15, 165, whoops, 165, and in increments of five. That's what we're doing here. This is cycling through a loop in increments of five. So 15 to 165 degrees. And then I will, to set the individual angles, you say my servo and angle is equal to our angle. And then after this, I'm gonna go and pause for half a second or meh, let's not even do it for half a second, so it's time, sleep, and oh, let's just do a half a second, it doesn't matter, wherever you'd like. And then I'm gonna do the opposite. So let's go like this, go here, and we'll change this to 165, change this to 15, increments of five, but we're gonna go in the opposite direction because we start high, go low, and everything else there looks good. So there you go, and now I'm gonna show you what it looks like. And you can see, of course, I have red connected to the 3.3 volts. I have ground attached, and then I am sending the pulse on the yellow cable. All right, so for the next project, I'm gonna show you how ultrasonic sonar distance sensors work. You're gonna need this library right here, and I'm gonna be using my Cricut, but you don't really have to. Just need a board with one of those sensors, again, in the description. Get rid of this stuff I don't need. And I'm going to import, add a fruit, HCSR04. And for this library to work, you just need to define where the trigger and the echo pins are. So I'm gonna call this sonar is equal to add a fruit, HCSR04 dot HCSR04 trigger pin equal to, and this is actually going to be board D9. A2 is actually digital D9 on here, and the echo pin is going to be board D10. So D10 is actually A3, the A3 pin. Then we create our infinite loop and try, because we can have errors, so we're gonna use exception handling. And what we want it to do is to return the distance in centimeters, so sonar distance. And this is normally works really well between two centimeters to 400 centimeters or one inch and 13 feet. And the exception, I'm gonna have this be runtime error. And we'll just say that it's gonna retry. All right, and then we'll say, throw a little bit of a delay in here, sleep, and 0 0.1, just a brief little sleep. And you can see it's outputting all sorts of information about distances. And as I move my hand closer and farther away, it is changing. All right, so really, really cool stuff. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take basically the same exact code and I'm gonna have it set up with a Cricut so that it is able to create a robot rover that can use the ultrasonic sensor to avoid hitting objects. So kind of advanced stuff. You're gonna need another library. Of course, you're gonna to need to get the Cricut library on here for this to work. So from add a fruit and Cricut import Cricut Again, we're gonna use this exact same line right here. I'm gonna need access to my motors to drive each of the wheels though. And this is gonna allow us to manipulate our motor speed and direction. So cricket.dc motor underscore one. And grab this, paste that there. And two, DC motor two. And then we have our infinite loop. So what I wanna do here first is I'm gonna get rid of this. And in here, I wanna say that when it starts, I wanna go 100% forward with both tires. To do that, we say M1 throttle is equal to negative one on the left wheel, or no, that would be the right wheel, I think. Yeah, and then M2 is going to be positive one. All right. And then what I wanna do is I want to return the distance in centimeters using our sensor that we have here. So I'm gonna say S distance is equal to the sonar 
distance. And I'm gonna go and ask some questions here. I'm gonna say, if the distance is less than or equal to, depending upon your tires, depending upon your what you're driving your car on and things like that, this might change a little bit, meaning the distance sensors. Because if your thing's moving very, very quickly, you might need to sense and start moving earlier. So if it's less than or equal to 20, what I want it to do is to go and turn in the opposite direction with the right wheel and have my left wheel just do nothing. So it's going to sort of turn around. So let's just change M2 to zero. Then I'm gonna give it time to turn. So I'm gonna go time sleep and I'm gonna say one and a half seconds to turn. And else, if it isn't close to something, well, in that situation, I'm just gonna have it continue going full speed ahead. So let's just copy this, paste that in there. There we go. And runtime error is something else we'd have a problem with here. We don't need this sleep because we handled that elsewhere. And there you go, and now I'll show you it working. And here it is, with some assistance from my daughter who's throwing boxes at my little robot, you can see that it is very good at avoiding collision. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a lot of what we've already done and make a remote controlled car that works with your IR remote control. So, what I wanna do, I want to provide the options to be able to turn on and off the remote control using the, or you turn off the vehicle using the on off button. So I'm gonna say, is it off or it isn't off? All right, it's off when it starts. Okay. We need the motor. Of course, the Pulse IO is going to be for the IR Cricket. This is the remote control um, board and time. You know what those do. Okay, so we got our board. Now, whenever we were going and pressing our remote control, we saw little numbers pop up that decoded. Well, the numbers for my specific remote control are going to be equal to 162 for my button, my power button, and the left button is going to be 48. Um, that is actually the number one on my little remote control. And then forward, which is going to be number two. This is probably gonna be different for you, of course, if you have a different remote control, so just use what I previously covered to figure out what your numbers are and go and use those. Right is gonna be my number three and back is going to be 56, which is number five on my remote. Okay, so there's those different things. Now what I need to do is I need to read the IR input and I'm gonna say pulse in is equal to pulse I O dot pulse in and it's going to be I R underscore R X and the max length again is going to be 120 pulses and the idle is going to be set for true true there we are okay and just reads the I R input from pin D2 or, or from the the infrared sensor up to 120 pulses and everything else there makes sense. Okay, so decoder, I'm gonna call add a fruit. This it decodes the infrared signals. So add a fruit, I R R E M mote dot generic decode. There we go. And infinite loop. So what are we gonna do in the infinite loop? So inside of the try block, well, actually before this, I am going to read pulses until they stop. So I'll say pulses is equal to decoder and read pulses by passing it pulse in. I can say that I want to output this information. So we can say heard, but I'm not gonna do that. I'll, I'll put that in the, the link underneath the video, but I'm not gonna put it in here because it's gonna be disconnected from this whole system. So it's not even gonna work. So I'm gonna say try code is equal to get our decode into bits from pulses. It's called decoder dot 
decode bits, pulses, and then after this, what I can do is I can go and do different things depending upon which button was pressed. So I'll say if, and I'm just gonna keep this very simple and non-optimized. So I'm gonna say if code three, I'm using the fourth index from the decoded list that is sent. Okay, so there's four items. It starts at zero, one, two, three. I want the last one. So I'm gonna say if code three is equal to the power button and if the car is currently off, well, in that situation, I'm going to set is off to false because it's not off. My car is now on and I'm going to set my motors to throttle and I want them both to go forward. So to do that, I set the right wheel for negative one and the left wheel for positive one. And then I'm gonna say continue with your looping. All right, and now I'm gonna do it for all the other different buttons. And it's basically just for simplicity state, I'm gonna copy this. I would normally put this in a function, but it's just gonna do it this way. So if it's power B and not, so if they hit the power button and it is not off, meaning it's on, well, in that situation, I wanna set it to off. So true, and then I just change this to zero, zero, and now the car stops driving, or it's effectively off. All right, so that makes my power button turn the car on and turn the car off. Now what I'd like to do is make the left button work. So I'm gonna change this to left button and not off. So if it's press the left button or the number one on my remote control and the vehicle is not off, well, in that situation, I want it to turn left, is off. Well, that's gonna be set to false. And I'm gonna set this to negative one and set this to zero. Everything else is the same. So let's copy this and let's put this down here. Now, if they go and hit the right button like that and it's not off, well, in that situation, I going to shut off this tire from moving or this motor and set this to one and it'll turn right. And if I want it to go forward, I can just say, did the forward button on a remote get pressed? Forward. And it's not off. Well, in that situation, negative one and one, that'll make it go just straight forward. And then also we could have it go backwards if we would like. This is going to be five on my remote control and was the back button pressed? And then I'm gonna set this to go backwards, which means the opposite of what it's doing. Whoops, get rid of that extra, there we are. And set this to negative one. And there you go. And then these are exactly the same exceptions that we used previously when working with remotes. All right, so there you go. And now I'm gonna show you it working. All right, so here's the remote controlled car. You can see that I can turn it on. I can make a turn, go forward, go backwards, do everything I wanted it to do. And like always, please leave your questions and comments down below. Otherwise, till next time.